everyone. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. Welcome again to The Empowering Neurologist. You know, a new term has entered our lexicon uh, at, in relationship to COVID-19. It's called long-haul COVID. And what does that mean? Well, there's a lot in this term that I think we need to unpack. It means uh, that people don't just get COVID, uh, go through their symptoms, and then make a recovery. That there are a significant number of individuals, and we're going to talk about that today, who in fact uh, may be left with persistent issues related to cardiovascular function, pulmonary function, uh, neurological issues, and even psychological issues, and it's becoming more important. Uh, we are now recognizing that this may represent a second uh, health crisis uh, related to this virus. So we really want to explore this notion of long-haul COVID, what it's all about, what may be causing it, and what the future looks like, our guest today is Dr. Carlos Del Rio. Uh, he's the author of a recent report appearing uh, in the Viewpoint section of the Journal of the American Medical Association entitled Long-Term Health Consequences of COVID-19. Dr. Del Rio is a distinguished professor of medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Emory University School of Medicine in Atlanta. So we're going to get right to this interview. Hello, Dr. Del Rio. Thank you for joining us today. Delighted to be with you. You know, we had this assumption that uh, the COVID event was pretty much going to be a monophasic event for people, that most people who got it now, we have 74 million at least recorded uh, infections uh, globally, that most people who get, uh, get this situation are going to have it, uh, do a little bed rest, and pretty much recover and do pretty well. But you brought to our attention the notion that that isn't exactly what we are now seeing. So when did this all change in terms of our perception? Well, I think it started with uh, some reports initially coming out of Italy and then coming out of other places, suggesting that about 14 to 20 percent of people who recovered from clinical COVID, primarily hospitalized at that point in time, uh, did three months after they had recovered, continued to complain of some symptoms. And those symptoms were, you know, fatigue, arthralgias, uh, cough, shortness of breath. And it was a little unusual to see people that long after hospitalization still having complaints. We then also started to see it ourselves. You know, we started to see people that had recovered who continued to complain of symptoms. We have continued to see it. And I, there's a colleague of mine that actually wrote a, a, a perspective about this in JAMA, an emergency medicine physician saying, you know, I just don't feel normal and I, I can't go back to work. And then we started to see other studies. There was a very important study from the CDC in which they call people who have tested positive, and many of them have not been hospitalized. And one in five mm -hmm. continued to complain of symptoms at least three weeks after they, quote unquote, had recovered. Well, we know that the NIH just uh, a week or two ago uh, put together a meeting to really uh, start to contextualize this, recognizing that exactly what you're describing may be affecting millions of people around the, the globe. And this, this may be uh, kind of the second a health crisis associated with this uh, whole pandemic that uh, you know really hasn't gotten much recognition as of late. Yes, I mean I think the NIH is you know we have what I would call at this point in time descriptive data, we have anecdotal data, but we actually need now some science, right? We need some cohort data, we need some uh, immunological data, we need some some really science behind this because as you know, uh, you know, we see long-term impact on, on respiratory system and others from people that have been very sick in the ICU regardless of any disease. So how do we separate what I would call the ICU, the post-ICU syndrome, to what could be the consequence of COVID? And I think there's, there's three major buckets that we all need to realize that are happening with COVID. Not, one is in the cardiovascular system. And again, the studies have been the, the maybe biased, but we have seen descriptions of of myocarditis and arrhythmias and, and heart failure, and people have recovered from COVID, ongoing myocardial inflammation. We see respiratory complications with, with you know, I tell people that the lung only knows how one way to recover, and that is through fibrosis, right? So if you have a lot of pneumonia and you were in a ventilator, maybe you'll develop fibrosis and therefore have that its long-term effect. But to me also very interesting are the, the neuropsychiatric impacts. And we're seeing this patients increasingly and this is affecting their, their, their ability to concentrate and to do other things. And to me, that is, uh, that is very concerning. 
Well, you know, you, you, you do talk in your article about the idea that uh, it's not uncommon for people getting out of the ICU, especially those who are on assisted ventilation, uh, mechanical ventilation, to in fact have issues as many as 46% down the line for a number of weeks, if not months. But one of the points that you made that I think is really uh, has a lot of traction is the notion that many of the people who are being involved with this are people who did not end up in an ICU and may not have even been hospitalized, uh, may have had a, a symptomatology done, uh, taken care of at home, and yet don't fully recover. So is there a way that we can predict because of this dichotomy with respect to our previous uh, understanding of post-illness events? Is there a way we can predict who might be more at risk uh, for developing long-term consequences? There's a lot of interesting developing uh, data in, in understanding, in doing more uh, predictions. But at this point in time, I don't think there's anything that, that clearly suggests the ability to predict this. Obviously, if you have underlying conditions, you're most likely to, to not recover fully. But you know, we've seen athletes, we've seen people that are just doing fine and, 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 and have long-term impacts. So I think at this point in time, I, I think that's part of the science that we need is, is how do we, is there any predictor model? Is there any uh, you know, immunological marker? Is there something else that we need to look at? I mentioned in the introduction uh, a, a bit about what you were saying about athletes. And uh, you know, these are individuals who do post COVID undergo uh, either uh, imaging of their heart or a clinical evaluation of heart function. And what you reported was really a significant percentage of those uh, young, healthy college athletes uh, who have evidence of, of post COVID damage. Yeah, and you know, again, we, we need a denominator, but those each one each one every one of those cases. I mean, you know, young people who then develop myocarditis and that could impact their career. I think that everybody pays attention to, right? And so, these cases are something that to me are very interesting, incredibly puzzling. And we see in in some biopsies evidence of viral uh, infection in the myocardium, and others we see uh, evidence of of cytokine storm and you know cytokine damage to the myocardium. So. I think understanding fully the, the, the pathogenesis is going to be really critically important because is there also anything we can do to prevent it? Well, you mentioned uh, in, in terms of the neurologic uh, uh, issues, you know, how common that is and how concerned you are about that. Uh, when you multiply that times the number of people who may ultimately be experiencing this, what are some of the proposed mechanisms that uh, may be at play here? Uh, you just mentioned the cytokine storm, of course, and we know uh, that the brain does not respond favorably to, to various cytokines, uh, both ac acutely and certainly long-term as it relates to chronic neurological degenerative conditions. But what are some of the other mechanisms that are proposed that might at least open up some avenues in terms of therapy? Well, one is clearly you know, direct impact of the virus. And, and we see that, for example, in HIV, HIV associated dementia and others. The other one is obviously you know, whether this is, is mediated by immune cells like macrophages and other cells that may be causing this. I mean, the reality is that we need a lot of research in this area and we really need a, a, a more in-depth understanding of what exactly happens. But I think what, what this is showing us is that COVID in some individuals, it's a systemic illness, right? It's not just a viral respiratory infection. And I think that to me is a really important uh it's a really important concept to get across because for many of us, initially, as you said, we thought COVID is going to be like other coronaviruses, just a respiratory infection. But obviously, it's more than that, and it has systemic implications. You know, one of the important points uh, that, um, that your article uh, brings up and that I really want to emphasize today is there seems to be this sense among younger, healthy individuals that, you know, well, whatever, if I get it, I'll get it, and I'll recover and, and sort of uh, that's it. What's the big excitement about? It's nothing more than a, a, a hard flu. So this really challenges that, that whole mentality, doesn't it? Well, it does. And again, you know, it's absolutely true. The great majority of people are going to do fine. Uh, but, you know, it's, I make it similar to saying, you know, driving fast or, or driving under the influence. The great majority of people are not going to die, right? But, but increases your risk significantly. And I think that's what it's so hard to communicate to people. It's not that it's going to happen to everybody, but your risk of this happening goes up and it goes up significantly. And, you know, there was even a paper uh, yesterday in JAMA 
talking about calling to attention the the excess mortality in young people. And we see young people, again, having a significant, almost a 38% increase in, in excess deaths. So that becomes significant. When it, uh, when it comes to uh, symptoms, uh, I mean, b- bad outcome, let's say, as it relates to this infection, uh, and we know that there are certain groups at risk for that bad outcome, such as individuals with existing cardiovascular disease, diabetes, uh, obesity, and certainly chronological age, what is it about these individuals that uh, really paves the way for them to have a bad outcome? And further, if I may, uh, would these people be at increased risk, in your opinion, for uh, with respect to long-term uh, issues related to this infection? Well, I think the, the, the fact that this virus has a much higher mortality the older you get, I think it's something that it's it's not unexpected, but it's been so consistent throughout this this crisis that I think makes it very hard to uh, to fully appreciate the impact, the mortality, the case fatality depends on really on your age. But I think there are two things: uh, diabetes, but in particular also morbid obesity that drives a lot of this. And you know, I tell to people that if you are 20 or 30, but your BMI is 40 then your risk of severe disease, death, and complications is more like a healthy 70-year-old person. And, and I think it really emphasizes the, the impact of this so-called non-communicable diseases in a communicable illness and what we have seen this in other diseases. I mean, this we've known in flu for a long time. People with influenza that have morbid obesity are more likely to have complications and death. I think really COVID has really brought that to the forefront, and we really need to start paying attention to better management in addressing you know, hypertension, diabetes, obesity as public health issues and really bringing those problems down in the control. But, but the other issue is really around, does that increase your, your risk of, of long-term complications? I'm not aware of any data that suggests that, but it certainly increases your risk of getting severe disease. And as you get severe disease, you're more likely to have complications. Mm-hmm. And, and, and finally, why... Does it seem that aside from you know the, the, the journals and, and some of the popular press that this notion of long-term consequences has generally been overlooked by you know the vast majority of population? Well, I think you know you're all we're all like drinking from the water, water hydrant, right? I mean, in the in the ERs and the ICUs, we're just trying to to basically keep people alive and, and do the best we can. So we still have not sat down to see what happens when people start showing up in clinic. But as, as post-COVID clinics are opening up across the country, we're beginning to see this. And I think those post-COVID clinics are clearly the place where this cohorts and this multi-center studies can be set up. And I think NIH is, is really very interested in understanding this at a, at a population level and really giving us a, a better description of the syndrome and understanding the pathogenesis and, and, and possibly some, you know, intervention studies, which I think are going to be critical. I think it's really important that we be in a, in a position to appreciate the, the nuances that become uh, obvious about this uh, event uh, as time evolves. I remember early on, there were some uh, concerns about one form of treatment versus another. Would uh, acetaminophen versus a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory increase your risk of bad outcome, et cetera? So I, I think you know an important message here is that people should in, gen, in general be available and open to kind of a changing narrative as it relates to this novel uh, experience that we're having. I, I think so. I think one thing that coronavirus has done is, is challenge our conventional wisdom, right? And made us think outside the box. And I think we need to do that. I think we need to start thinking. In, and when we think about chronic uh, long-term COVID, start thinking about what, what could it be and what things can be done. And I hope that the research is done early as opposed to wait on, and start trying things without protocols and without you know, sort of experimental approaches. Well, that said, uh, it, it's certainly clear that uh, immunizations have been expedited uh, in a way that we've never seen before. Uh, it, it looks as if, you know, based on the mechanisms of how these mRNA uh, immunizations work, that it's probably going to turn out to be an appropriate uh, exp- uh, expedited uh, approach. Uh, what is your sense in terms of where we are currently on immunization and uh, how might that ultimately be, in your, in your ter- uh, opinion, effective long-term with respect to not just, uh, the, not just COVID as we see it now, but perhaps some of the permutations that may come down the line? 
Well, I think, let me just say that the technology that has allowed us to have these vaccines is, while it's new in the world of vaccinology, it's not new, mRNA and, and DNA vaccine technology have been you know, researched for the last 10 years. And again, emphasizes the importance of basic science research that led us to develop this techniques and these approaches that then were tested in COVID and worked effectively. And, and I think it really emphasizes the importance of research and basic research and getting us there, giving us the tools that we're using. The second thing is I think that the, uh, the, 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 the way that the vaccines are now ready to start rolling out and they're rolling out in different places across the country and across the world, it's incredibly exciting, gives us all hope, you know, that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. But I think about it more about, you know, we just started the, the hike to the peak of Everest. You know, it's going to be a long road ahead. It's going to take a while to get there. And, and many are going to die on the way up there because there's still ongoing transmission. There's still thousands of people dying in our country. So while the vaccines are going to give us hope, it's not going to be immediate. It's going to take some time to get to where we need to. I think by the summer, it's going to be in a different position. I think by the summer, we're going to see the true impact of the vaccine at the population level. But for the time being, we still have a long road ahead with a lot of disease happening. I think that for two reasons, A, the, the possibility of these long-term uh, issues, symptoms that we've talked about today, and B, because of the, um, I wouldn't say delay, but just the fact that there's a timeline associated with immunization, that now is not the time to, to cash in the chips. And uh, we, I, I've been saying we really need to double down on our efforts to do all the things that we know are proven effective in terms of reducing our risk. You know, I wouldn't say we see the light at the end of the tunnel just yet, but we know it's, it, it certainly looks like it's coming. I would agree with you, and I think it's exactly right. You don't want to, this is the time to double down and actually get to the time you get vaccinated uh, alive and not infected. Terrific. Well, listen, uh, thank you so much for your time and, and also for um, all that you're doing there uh, in Atlanta uh, to move the ball down the field. So we really appreciate it. Delighted to be with you. Well, we certainly learned a lot today, didn't we? There's a lot more to COVID-19 than we had first appreciated. Uh, it really tends to uh, shed a new light on this problem, affecting a significant percentage of people globally. So we're talking about millions of people who right now have uh, persistent symptoms. Where the future will go with these individuals is unclear. So it really does represent something that we're going to have to pay close attention to. And uh, certainly here on the Empowering Neurologist, we will do our best to keep you uh, informed as it relates to this ever-evolving story. Well, thanks for joining us today. I'm Dr. David Perlmutter. We will be back soon. Bye for now.